interned for a law firm called uh, Lord Day and Lord, which you might know as the law firm that represented the New York Times in New York Times v. Sullivan many years earlier. And when he was an associate that summer, the old guys at the firm would tell these stories about the cases they handled. And you know, the kids' eyes would light up, like maybe one day he could work on such important cases that would affect the future of free speech. And when I interviewed Ben Lee, we were in the, the Twitter cafeteria, because uh, he's now a lawyer for Twitter. And the, the sort of central argument I make is that 50 years from now, when we think about um, the sort of major uh, episodes uh, you know, advancing free expression and the law of free expression, today, 50 years from now, we'll be remembering the lawyers at Twitter, Google, Tumblr, and WordPress. And a lot of the most interesting free speech lawyering today is happening there. Uh, and when I, when, he, when I met with Ben, he had just uh, spent a few months negotiating with the French government over um, handing over the names of certain people who had tweeted hate speech. And so the case was sort of an internationally well-known case uh, that he'd, he'd handled, where uh, in October of 2012, the third highest trending hashtag in France was the, the hashtag un bon juif, which means a good Jew. Uh, and along with most of the tweets were a good Jew is a dead Jew. Uh, others were a good Jew and then a, a link to a picture of uh, ash or of some, you know, someone in a concentration camp or you know, tweets like uh, a good Jew should be well done, not rare. Just like vile hate speech, which is protected in the US but was illegal in France, had to be removed off of Twitter, and then there was a long fight between Twitter and France over whether or not uh, Twitter would hand over the names of the anonymous speakers so that they could be prosecuted. Right? And Twitter uh, is an anonymous platform, unlike Facebook. They believe in anonymous speech, which is sort of core of the First Amendment tradition. And this was you know, one of the cases they had to handle among the many cases that fell on his, on his plate. And um, I had once actually uh, spent an afternoon talking to the Twitter guys, sort of helping them think through what they should do in China. You know, what, what should they do with their product? How should they make sure that they could introduce their product in China in a way that doesn't compromise folks? Would it be read-only? Would, um, would it be something that doesn't allow retweets? Would you delete content just in China, not in other places? Sort of the, the hard questions of designing the product as well as what the policies would be uh, if they were to go in China. And the, the folks in these companies, this one's I deal with, have a self-conception, especially Twitter, sort of the, the shining example, self-conception of being the new media, being the place that people go for free expression today. Uh, the general counsel of Twitter describes Twitter, the former general counsel describes Twitter as the free speech wing of the free speech party. It might, it might be propaganda, but that's their propaganda, right? This is the New York Times, is all the news that's fit to print. Um, the you know the, the co-founder of Twitter did a blog post called "The Tweets Must Flow." That was the first principle that they would try not to censor tweets, uh, and the CEO now calls it the new town square, right? Sort of wrapping themselves up in the language of uh, free expression cases. So, um, the 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 real thesis I want to get across is that there is a lot of very interesting free speech lawyering going on on the internet platforms that we use every day. That's sort of the core thing I want you to, I want you to come away from, from knowing, uh, from thinking. Uh, the, the method of this paper was to actually interview these folks. So I interviewed the general counsel of Tumblr, the general counsel of WordPress, uh, talked to some of the senior lawyers at Twitter, Google, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Wikipedia, uh, even Yelp. Um, uh, Yelp, they're, they're, you probably don't think of this, but their entire uh, website is content by their users commenting, critiquing local businesses, doctors, you name it. Uh, and they have been in litigation over unmasking the sources of those reviews uh, in Virginia. And when you speak to the lawyers at Yelp, they say, we, treat, we think of our reviewers as sources the same way newspapers do. When you talk to Twitter, they say, we have a church-state divide when it comes to content and advertising. They have been influenced by the history that, of, of, uh, of newspaper lawyers. Um, and so the... Uh, when I interviewed them, there's sort of three sorts of influences on free expression today for all of us that 
were made evident in the interviews that you wouldn't come away with if you were simply a Supreme Court watcher. Three sources of, of regulation of free speech outside of judicial sources. One, the power of private regulators of speech, private gatekeepers, platforms, you name it. Um, if, let's just begin as an example of a of sort of a private gatekeeper. Take out your phone, take out your iPhone, go to, go to Twitter. And you, you all have Twitter, right? <laughs> Did any of you not have Twitter? Okay, take out your iPhone, not, not, your, not your Android, and then uh, <laughs> go to any tweet, and you can reply to the tweet, you can retweet, you can star the tweet, or you can push the one on the right hand corner, which gives you the option of um, mail tweet, copy link to tweet, send a pocket, or report tweet. Right? And then if you report the tweet, you're given several different options. Is it spam? Is it abusive? Does it violate the, quote, Twitter rules? What are the Twitter rules? Right? Those are the rules that govern you uh, in the world of Twitter. Right? That's sort of the private speech. They, they write those rules. So um, the second source of power uh, is international norms. Uh, and so Facebook, when, when you talk to Facebook, they say, we have one Facebook globally. There isn't a Facebook for France and a Facebook for the US. We have one Facebook. Uh, and they, 80% um, of their users are foreign, are not American. So if you mention the First Amendment to them, they don't even, they think in terms of the First Amendment, they also think in terms of free expression generally. And most of their users are abroad. And the third source of power outside of judicial power that has uh, a huge influence on our speech uh, and the daily lives of these lawyers uh, is congressional statutes. Right? So in addition to private power and international power, congressional statutes. If you were to ask, and as I did, you know, the lawyer at Tumblr, uh, you know, what, do you, what do you think of New York Times v. Sullivan today? I, he called it, I think overstating the point, hilariously irrelevant. Right? But, you know, to him, the, the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act uh, is the greatest thing that Congress has done in the last two decades and is the reason why, why uh, internet companies can, can flourish and, and remain. And that has to do with uh, the, the liability imposed on Tumblr the same way that New York Times v. Sullivan has to do with the liability imposed on the New York Times. Right? And that's congressional. That was not the, uh, the justices coming to the rescue that's, that's been de that was debated in Congress, adopted by Congress. Um, okay. Oh, and then a few things I, I'm not saying. Um, I'm not saying uh, these lawyers are perfect. They always do the right thing. You know, the New York Times is deeply imperfect. I just, I, what I found interesting was sort of the, the corporate interest in both the New York Times and these companies to advocate for free speech in certain circumstances. Um, I'm also not saying newspapers don't matter. I think they do. Um, the idea for this paper came when I went to a dinner by the committee, um, committee to protect freedom of the press, and you know the publisher of the Washington Post was there, but so were you know an entire table of Google lawyers and entire labor of tw Twitter lawyers. It was just sort of this collection of tech lawyers and newspaper lawyers that made me realize something was changing here. Um, I'm also not saying the Supreme Court doesn't matter. Uh, or that the U.S. doesn't matter. Nor am I endorsing. Uh, nor am I endorsing. Uh, Jeffrey Rosen has written about this a little bit in Popular Press, and he he has said things like, "Google lawyers have more power over speech than does the U.S. Supreme Court." <laughs> I actually don't agree with that. Not, you don't have to believe that to agree with me. Uh, that these tech lawyers have a self conception uh, of being speech lawyers, as defending freedom of expression, uh, and they have a, a, a massive impact. So. Um, just to, to, to give you an idea of scale to some extent, so the New York Times is the most, has the highest number of views on its website per month, and that's 29 million, and has 2 million in, in circulation. Right? So Twitter has 200 million users, Facebook has over a billion, YouTube has over a billion, right? 30, 40 times the number of the New York Times. And a lot of the traffic to the New York Times get sent initially from Facebook or Google. So, so Google and Facebook and, and these other companies are, are clearly part of you know, where people get their news. WordPress is a platform for creating blogs. I don't know if any of you, if you use it. 70 million people do. Uh, 350 million people you know, read WordPress. And Tumblr has 135 million blogs, right? Just massive platforms for distribution. Um, and then if you're one of the people who cares about money, if that's sort of a good way to think about things, New York Times is a huge company, a $2 billion company. Right? It's 
200 times smaller than Google. Uh, Washington Post was sold for 250 million. It's 16,000 times smaller than, than Google. Right, so so I mean, Google, granted, is a conglomerate, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's sort of the impact out there. Uh, and you know, if you're a young lawyer looking for a job in freedom of expression, you might be more likely to find jobs in companies that are 200 times bigger. So that may be where you end up. Right. So the difference between uh, a Tumblr or a, or a Twitter or, um, or Facebook. Uh, and traditional media is that they tend to be platforms for other people's speech, not the speech of their employees and their journalists. Right? And so the kinds of rules and the way you think about freedom of expression uh, would change. Right? When you talk to the folks at WordPress uh, and Twitter, they both use the same exact language, which is we really want to fight for the user's voice. That's, that's the language they often use. That's sort of the, the core free speech principle that they try to aspire to. Um, and even in the company missions, right? I mentioned Twitter, you know, claims to be the free speech wing of the free speech party. You know, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universal and accessible. It's a very, it's a speech-based mission, the same way the New York Times has one. Uh, WordPress, their mission is to democratize publishing. And also, when you talk to these lawyers, they talk about their owners, the way newspaper lawyers sort of reverentially speak about their publishers and owners. And, um, and there are very few public companies that have dual classes of stock where the owner sort of controls, you know, has sort of the privilege to publish whatever they want without worrying about losing control of the company. Right? You know, newspapers traditionally had dual classes, uh, so does Facebook, so does Google. They sort of have this, I don't know if it's because of the free speech implications, but they're kind of this weird company where people sort of trust the owners. Um, and if you look at sort of Twitter, just as one example, Evan Williams, was not only the founder of Twitter, he was also the founder of Blogger, the first blogging platform. He's also the founder of Medium, another sort of blogging speech platform. You know, the folks who worked for him at Twitter think of him as someone who thinks deeply about the future of free expression, the future of media, someone who could write a book on the topic if he wanted to, and that he was actually animated by these principles. That's sort of the, the, the notion you get. And I know, I know the lawyers best, obviously. Um, and just to give you an indication of the kind of lawyers you have there, not only Ben Lee, who dreamed about working for the New York Times. Um, when I first met with the lawyer for Dropbox, the general counsel of Dropbox, the first lawyer they hired, he told me he went to NYU and that his favorite professor, and he had three classes with this professor named Yochai Benkler. Did I know him? Right. And there's something sort of special about a person whose favorite professor in law school is Yochai Benkler. Uh, just read the transparency report that Dropbox came out with, and you, you sort of, you sort of, it's you know, it's very detailed transparency report. It's sort of the kind of person who might have come from the Yochai Benkler school of of learning. Uh, when I when I first met with Tumblr, uh, their general counsel mentioned their favorite professor was Yochai Benkler, and that made me know that this was the kind of company I'd want to want to do some work for. Um, and a lot of the folks at these top companies, you know, have relationships you know come from Harvard come from Yale you know you find their names as research assistants in, in Larry Lessig's books etc they sort of come from the same community of folks who've thought about um, you know how to keep the you know the internet free or how to think about free expression right? this is something that they've actually given a lot of thought to so the um, the, the substance of the argument in terms of the the three sources of power today beyond uh, judicial power. Right? First, we're beginning with, with private power. And I don't think I have to convince all of you the power of Google and Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr. But if you've ever looked at their terms of service, uh, you really get an idea of how they can determine what you say on those services or not. And uh, you know, when it comes to Tumblr's terms of service, for example, apparently the CEO himself helped write it and thinks of the terms of service as an extension of the product. And if you looked at the, uh, the privacy policy for Dropbox, it's like written in English. It's only a page. Right? So that's another company that tries to think of the privacy policy as an extension of the product. And when you, when you look at the terms of service, it only gives you a, a small fraction of what actually happens. It's sort of like reading the statute and not knowing the cases. Uh, so Facebook has you know, their, their policies, and then they have these other policies um, that their internal trust and safety team implements. So lawyers write these policies, and then in order to implement them, every time you report, um, well, let me back up. Every single Facebook post has a report button. 
every single YouTube video has a report this video button. Every tweet you can report. Um, every piece of content on the web just about you can, you can report for some reason. Right? So when you report it, what, what happens then? What happens generally is the trust and safety team, which is non-lawyers. Right? There's about more than 40 of them at Twitter, several hundred at Facebook, uh, and they're around the world. They look at the comment. They look at your sort of report. Or they, don't, they don't screen content in advance. They look at it, and then they match your uh, objection and the content with their internal guidelines, which are more detailed than the, the terms of service that you've seen on your website. Right? And then they determine, do we, keep, do we take this content down or keep it up? That's sort of the, the structure of you know, free expression on those sites or censorship, whatever you want to call it. And when it comes to the, and there have been lots of controversies and you know, um, lots of interesting stories there about how do you define hate speech. Uh, there's a controversy around Facebook maybe not being sensitive enough to hate speech targeting women, changing their policies and how they, how they implemented them. Uh, the terms do not comport with the First Amendment generally. Generally, there are exceptions that go beyond the First Amendment. So uh, they often um, forbid bullying of children, porn, um, hate speech, all things that would be protected under the First Amendment, which is to say, that if you um, said something that was hate speech, the government could not throw you in prison, right? It couldn't prosecute you. Um, whereas uh, these, these companies will simply like not let you speak on their platforms. Um, and, and these companies actually have very different, um, very different thinking on this. Uh, so, so they're not, they're not, um, they're not uniform. So, there are organizations that rate companies for their willingness to suppress hate speech. Uh, there, are, there are organizations that are against hate speech and sort of fight it. And one of them, for example, gave, gave Twitter an F for being lackadaisical towards hate speech and gave Facebook an A minus for doing a great job sort of suppressing hate speech. Right? So, so there's different companies sort of take a different line based on their business interests and what they're, what they're trying to be. Now, the, the risks of this private power um, have been written about a little bit. Right? What's, what's the problem with Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and Twitter being able to censor content and to sort of delete you from the internet? Um, I, I, the, Jack Balkan in a paper later today uh, refers to it as sort of collateral censorship. Uh, the idea that the government can make a phone call uh, to someone at Google uh, and instead of going to court, getting a court order, meeting the standards of the First Amendment, could simply with a phone call uh, get the content removed. Right? And uh, one of the more, more well-known episodes involves WikiLeaks. Um, someone in this room wrote a, wrote a paper on, on how the government was able to pressure PayPal and Amazon and others to, not, to, to disassociate themselves with WikiLeaks and not provide them service. Uh, I think that's a huge, a huge problem Definitely worth thinking about. Definitely um, don't want to understate that problem. What I find um, slightly uh, comforting, right, the same way I find it comforting that there are free speech lawyers at the New York Times, is that there are folks at a lot of these companies that think about free expression that, in a way that I think is probably more front of, front of mind than the lawyers at PayPal or Amazon. Right? So it doesn't mean that, that the sources of it doesn't mean they're not weak links in the, in the chain, but they're not nearly as weak as the folks at, at Visa and PayPal and, and Amazon. And the government has leverage at sort of every level. Um, the, the second main criticism you hear, um, which also I think is valid, is that you go to Facebookistan and face, Facebookistan has its own set of rules around speech that are different from the US. Um, and my main response to that is that I don't actually believe that the rules governing Facebookistan are all that different from the rules governing us in real life, despite the First Amendment. The First Amendment says people who engage in hate speech don't get thrown in jail. But when we walk around in our daily lives, we've still managed to silence a lot of the hate speech and porn out there unless we're looking for it. We've done that through a whole bunch of different rules, uh, including uh, you know, the fact that um, People who own private property can, can remove you if you engage in hate speech or uh, indecent speech. Um, we, we have a lot of content neutral regulation that make it you know, impossible for somebody who's 
at a funeral being if you're at a funeral that's being protested by the Westboro Baptist Church, you might not even see the protesters. Right? In the famous Supreme Court case involving a funeral protest by that church, uh, the father who brought the case didn't even see the protesters. They were so far away. So we've figured out lots of ways to zone um, hate speech away from us. Even when you watch TV, right? When you read the news, right? it's very cable. It's very rare to stumble upon hate speech because of the rules that they have. And so I, I think Facebookistan, uh, for better or worse, is much like you know United Statesistan in actuality. Because when you walk around in your daily life, you know we celebrate the fact that people can't get thrown in jail for hate speech. We don't see it very much. We've sort of removed it from our purview. Um, and it's not that hard to find porn and hate speech online if you really want to look. But you know, so I still think it's a problem. But I think it's it's not as it's not as deep a problem uh, comparatively. Um, so then, um, international power. So as I mentioned, 80% of Facebook users are abroad, and there's been a lot written about um, the borders of cyberspace and how an American company uh, should respond to speech restrictions in foreign countries. Right? There are lots of countries where hate speech is illegal. Uh, lots of countries where you know censorship is the norm, and the without weighing too much on, on you know, the, the future of you know, jurisdiction across government lines, you know, the, the main point is that these lawyers have to think far more broadly than just the US First Amendment. Uh, there are a lot of people ar around the world for whom you know, they live in democracies and hate speech is looked upon very differently. And there are different ways to, to address that, right? If you were a lawyer for Facebook or Twitter or another company, you'd have to sort of come up with a policy that works. And you, know, you, get, you have the initial sort of question of, do we even go into this country? That's a, a debate that Ch Google had over China for many years. Should we go into this country? Uh, should we have people on the ground in this country that could be arrested? Should we try, you know, make ourselves available uh, from you know, a server outside the country? Or should we simply you know, not, not even try to make ourselves available? And then once you go into a country, you have to ask, you know, what am I going to comply with and what won't I? Um, you know, Twitter has a policy they're very proud of where they will take down content of a tweet only within that country, only subject to a legal order that would be legal in that country. Um, which, you know, in lots of countries, you can probably get a legal order for censorship pretty easily. But at least it's better than just having the president's brother call you. Right? They at least require an order, and they delete it or, or make it inaccessible only for that country. So that's sort of the way they've tried to make that balance. Uh, they've been second-guessed by some people. They've been praised by others. And it's sort of a, a, a core question that if you're thinking about how do I become a free speech lawyer, what, what, what are the considerations, it's so much broader than the Supreme Court law now that it includes thinking through the norms and traditions of other countries and, and how you can balance that. So finally, um, congressional power. Uh, so Jack Balkan mentioned earlier the importance of industry structure for the free speech environment, that a court, a court handles a case sort of after Congress and the industry has sort of set up a structure and they're sort of evaluating discrete pieces of it. Uh, you know, Congress actually ends up playing a huge role in shaping uh, our, our ability to communicate with one another. You know, not only through you know, rules that you've probably heard of like net neutrality or the debate over SOPA shaping you know, the future of copyright law or even you know, unlicensed wireless allocations, right? sort of geeky stuff that mainly Congress deals with, not the courts. Um, the, the number one uh, sort of set of rules that the platforms Find, you know, really praise and find, find really important cornerstones of free expression, sort of their analogy to the New York Times we saw of today, are rules that make them not liable for the speech of their users. So if you remember New York Times v. Sullivan, New York Times published an advertisement by the Committee to Defend Martin Luther King. And the New York Times was sued uh, for the libel in that advertisement. And the New York Times won a ruling saying that they wouldn't be guilty unless there was actual malice towards, you know, towards the, the person who was allegedly libeled. In that case, the ACLU and other, and other organizations filed an amicus brief saying, hey, if you, have, if you have a low standard for libel, 
where the New York Times gets guilty of libel all the time, that'll make it hard for us third parties to get advertisements into the New York Times. Right? The New York Times is sort of an intermediary publishing our speech occasionally, and we need a standard that makes the New York Times not afraid to publish us. Right? When you get to the internet, you take that to like the nth degree because YouTube gets 100 hours of video a minute uploaded. And if there was a standard that every video that might libel Mark Tushnet, right, would make Google liable for that libel. Like Google would have to, have to censor or screen. It would be, it'd be a real burden to just be an open platform for everyone. And the way we've addressed that isn't through a, a decision like New York Times v. Sullivan with the actual malice standard. It's with a congressional statute, CDA 230, which essentially gives you know, all these companies pretty blanket immunity. Like the actual language is they shall not be treated as a publisher or a speaker of the speech of someone else. So I can you know, upload a video libeling Mark Tushnet, and uh, Google will not be treated as a publisher or speaker of it. That's 230. And that's, you know, I could just read quote after quote from all of these lawyers saying how it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay, this is, you know, for them, it's the same reverence that, that uh, a lot of scholars have for the New York Times v. Sullivan case. Uh, and then there are other sort of intermediary liability statutes that, um, that, that are notable, but that's really the key one. And so what I want to leave you with is just the, the notion that you know, I do think a lot, of the, a lot of today's most interesting free speech lawyering for good or ill is happening you know, in Silicon Valley, in New York, at tech companies, uh, that uh, the world they see involves a lot of private speech power, hard calls, non-clear law where they're making the decisions, trying to implement it, uh, a world where international norms are really important, maybe as important as you know, knowing the Supreme Court decision making, and where congressional power and congressional statutes are really meaningful. And I think that changes uh, both how you try to you know, influence the future of free expression and the, the environment we live in. So thank you. Thank you, Marvin, um, for giving us a very good reality check uh, on what's happening in the world of free speech policy making. I tend to agree with Jeffrey Rosen, actually, that um, big private media companies like Facebook have much more power today over what gets said and communicated than the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, as you might suspect, I take a somewhat less sanguine view of this power um, that private companies like Facebook have with their terms of service. Uh, so whatever their good intentions, um, as Marvin pointed out, uh, there are very broad, differing with each of these companies, uh, terms of service uh, that go way beyond um, prohibiting what would be considered not protected speech under the First Amendment. So let me um, first just give you a few examples of what I mean, what I think the problems are <coughs> with this new world of uh, policing of speech online, uh, then talk just briefly about Section 230 and the big gaping hole in 230, which is um, intellectual property um, uh, liability. And then just a few words about the continuing relevance of Times v. Sullivan. So first, um, the uh, brave new world of private censorship on the internet. Um, here's Facebook's uh, terms of service. Quote, you will not post content that is hate speech, threatening, or pornographic, incites violence or contains nudity or graphic or gratuitous violence, end quote. So uh, within this rather broad range of prohibitions, it's true there are a few categories of speech that aren't protected by the First Amendment, true threats, true incitement, and some subcategory of pornography uh, that might, under some local community standards, qualify as constitutionally unprotected obscenity. But even for these unprotected categories within Facebook's terms of service, uh, there's no judicial determination uh, of whether the speech is constitutionally protected or not. Just the best guess of Facebook censors and um, these broad terms of service, and then as Marvin has told us, these internal guidelines, which we don't know about, which are interpreted by hundreds of internal censors. Uh, and if there is any uh, appeals process for somebody whose speech is taken down by Facebook, uh, it's mysterious at best. And I can give you a couple of uh, examples of this, and there are a great many um, that one could choose from, but I'll just give you two. One was an incident just a few months ago 
when there was a controversy over a nude statue uh, in a public park in Kansas. And it was your sort of classic nude. It wasn't anything uh, particularly uh, provocative, but um, there was public opposition. Uh, so there is a local controversy, and the ACLU, among other uh, groups, is involved in this. And ACLU posts on its Facebook page an article about the controversy with a picture of the nude statue. Uh, and this is taken down, presumably because somebody clicked on the report button. Uh, and it took the ACLU has written quite a lot about this, um, attempts that they made to locate who within Facebook they could communicate with to appeal the decision. Uh, and because they're the ACLU, they were able to get uh, some attention paid to the problem, uh, and eventually the picture was reinstated because this a uh, broad prohibition of nudity that I read to you as parts of the t part of the terms of service only applies sometimes. And in fact, Facebook does make uh, some judgments about what kind of nudity it's going to allow and what kind of nude images it's not going to allow. Uh, but the point was that for a crucial period during which this was a newsworthy subject of discussion on Facebook, uh, the relevant uh, information was not available. Um, and many such incidents, there would not be uh, an appeal that would be successful. Uh, just one other example comes from another anti-censorship group, the National Coalition Against Censorship, which publishes a, um, a web archive called The File Room, which is a report of censorship incidents around the world. And if it's a piece of visual art, there is usually a, um, an image. Uh, so in this instance, it was a photograph by Nan Golden, one of the most prominent documentary photographers in America. Some of her work is provocative. Uh, and the, the domain name host for the National Coalition Against Censorship not only decided they didn't like the picture, um, but they uh, ejected um, NCAC entirely from the domain. Uh, in that instance, NCAC was able to find another no domain name provider to uh, host the file room. Uh, but, of course, there's no other Facebook at the moment. Uh, and, um, as we know, the great bulk of what Facebook is prohibiting is constitutionally protected speech. I've given you some examples from the area of dis different judgments that might be made about nude images. Uh, similarly, judgments about what content is gratuitously violent or hateful toward a religious um, or ethnic group can vary widely and the result will be subjective uh, and unpredictable censorship of literature, art, and political discussion. Okay, so um, we had some con conversation about who's a common carrier and who's not or who should be this morning. Uh, Facebook is clearly not a common carrier, uh, probably has its own First Amendment rights to censor whatever it wants uh, in order to main the kind, maintain the kind of social space uh, that it wants. Um, and as several students in my censorship class at NYU last semester uh, informed me when we discussed this, if people don't like Facebook's rather broad uh, censorship policies, they will leave Facebook and go to some other uh, social media site. Uh, so one can argue, despite the immense power they have, this is really okay. It's still an open marketplace out there. And I suppose you might say the same about search engines. Um, a business, as we know, that's long been dominated by Google. Uh, arguably, people will move to another uh, search engine if they find Google's results too censorious. Uh, but there are some big differences. First, they have to know what's being uh, censored or filtered from their search results. Um, and second, there really is a distinction between a social media site that claims to be creating its own character and tone, and a search engine that is really basically a sophisticated mechanical tool. Um, yet, uh, Google's, uh, this is an example from Google's UK customized search terms of service. So this is when you have a website and you want to have a search engine on your website. Uh, if you sign up with Google, uh, not only will you have to have Google Ads on your website, um, but uh, you have to comply with their terms of service. And this is a quote from Google's UK uh, terms of service page. Um, some of these terms will be familiar to you. Quote, uh, prohibiting any pornographic, hate-related, violent, or 
uh, and here's um, one of my favorites, offensive content. So I don't know what Google's lawyers have told their internal censors about what is offensive content, but those are the terms of service, so they're really claiming a very wide um, um, amount of power. Okay, Google also, uh, you may be surprised to know, and I was surprised to learn this again from a student in my class, um, also censors your general searches. Um, now, it's a little difficult to actually find out what's really going on here, but there certainly have been reports that Google's default setting is an internet filter called Safe Search, described by Google on its family safety page as, quote, designed to screen sites that contain sexually explicit content and remove them from your search results. Because, Google says, well, quote, while no filter is 100% accurate, Safe Search helps you avoid content you may prefer not to see or would rather your children did not stumble across, end quote. So there's no time here to go into um, the many flaws of internet filters, but those of you who are familiar with internet filtering technology, I think will probably agree with me that the statement that no filter is 100% accurate is a rather large understatement. Uh, putting aside the flaws of any filtering system, um, we could ask ourselves what business is it of the Google search engine to decide for all of its huge diversity of users that they may prefer not to see what its automatic bots and spiders have determined based on the safe search filter is sexually explicit. Um, I further learned from a student who did a term paper on this that in December of 2012, Google made it impossible to disable safe search. Although it claimed that users could still access sexually explicit content if they made their, their searches, their search terms very specific. For example, by including the word porn. Uh, then through Google you could in fact find porn despite the safe search filter. I'm not quite sure how that technologically works. But what if you're not, if you don't want porn and you don't want to type porn into your search term but you're looking for sexually explicit sex education information, for example, or uh, you won't know what safe search is blocking. So I would argue, and then this goes back to some of the conversation we had this morning, that a search engine, unlike a social media site uh, like Facebook, there's good arguments why a search engine should really be categorized by the FCC as a common carrier, um, just as uh, the FCC should get around to recategorizing ISPs as common carriers in order to implement rules of net neutrality, which so far the courts have struck down because the FCC has not um, identified ISPs as common carriers. Okay, so um, a little bit about Section 230 and the other important statute that Marvin mentions in his paper but didn't get around to mentioning here, um, Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which, is, which addresses what's left out of 230, that is to say, intellectual property claims. So while to, Section 230 uh, is indeed wonderful and can be analogized, I think, to Times B. Sullivan um, in terms of relieving um, social media sites like Facebook, search engines like Google, um, blog hosting sites of potential liability for torts like defamation, invasion of privacy, virtually everything um, that the particular poster of the information uh, could be liable for, um, except intellectual property claims. Um, 230 does not prohibit, its purpose is to encourage a wide range of, dare I say, um, um, uninhibited, uh, robust and wide open speech on the internet, but it doesn't require these very powerful private um, sites um, to allow uncensored speech. It only relieves them of liability, which it's questionable whether they would be liable anyway as contributorily contributing to some tort. Uh, and so the result we have is that although it's a wonderful um, Magna Carta for the internet uh, private corporations that now have so much power over our speech, since it doesn't prohibit them from censorship, the result we have is the kinds of terms of service uh, and takedowns that we've talked about. 
Uh, so just a minute on the um, big loophole in section 230, which is section 512 of the DMCA. And that, um, as a result of whatever political processes we might choose to attribute it to, Congress has made a gift basically to the media industry, the copyright owner industry. Uh, and in the case of um, alleged copyright or other intellectual property violations, um, Section 230 doesn't apply, uh, the implication being the host site that has not created the content but is merely hosting the content uh, could be liable, but under 512 they are um, immune from liability if upon receipt of a takedown letter, uh, and these letters are generated, machine generated by the hundreds and thousands uh, by um, people within either the media companies themselves or companies to whom they have contracted out the business of searching the web to find potentially copyright infringing content somewhere. So a takedown letter gets generated, sent to Google or Facebook or uh, WordPress or whoever it is saying uh, in good faith we believe there's a copyright violation here and if the host takes back takes down the content, quote, in the words of the statute, expeditiously, um, they will not be liable. So this is, shall we say, a big motivation for takedowns. Now there's no judicial determination that the sender of the takedown letter even owns the copyright in the material in question, no less a determination that, um, uh, that there is no uh, applicable defense, such as fair use. So this is, um, this legislation, uh, as Marvin says, uh, Congress has, um, has taken a leading hand in um, regulating content um, rather than leaving it to the Supreme Court uh, in the brave new world of cyberspace. But with Section 512, it has basically enabled uh, copyright owner companies uh, to force suppression of um, material that they are asserting without any judicial determination um, is uh, an infringement. And um, there is a provision for a counter notice if the uh, host uh, notifies the, can identify uh, the person who actually posted the allegedly infringing material. Uh, they are required to send a notice and if the person files a counter notice um, agreeing to be sued, um, the material has to be reinstated within 10 days. So there's a 10-day period in which the suppression, and again, if it's a situation like the one I described with the statue in Kansas, uh, where something is timely, newsworthy and timely, uh, there's this power to completely remove it from the internet for 10 days. And of course, the question is whether, even in the absence of Section 512, um, uh, a site that is a host site and not a publisher of the information would be liable for some kind of co contri contributory copyright infringement. And the cases are, there aren't that many, the precedents sort of go both ways, but there's certainly a strong argument that they are simply pipelines and they are not contributory negligent. So um, I'm not alone in uh, suggesting that Section 512 um, strikes a balance between copyright ownership and uh, free expression in a way that's too heavily weighted toward the copyright owners. So just briefly, um, a word about what's left of Times v. Sullivan. And I think Marvin rightly suggests that uh, there are other arbiters now of free speech and censorship um, that are, um, if not e um, more important, certainly equally important than what the Supreme Court has to say. But um, I'd say there's quite a bit that's uh, still important about Times v. Sullivan. And the first um, point I would make is that, as Marvin uh, points out, the current generation of lawyers, um, whatever struggles they're having with France or with their own terms of service and the decisions that have been made by management about what's going to be allowed and what isn't, they are inspired by the spirit of Times v. Sullivan. So, and I always like to tell my students this too, you should read these Supreme Court cases um, because they are part of our literature. Uh, so stirring phrases like 
uninhibited, robust, and wide open, have gone beyond the facts of the Times v. Sullivan case and the historical period, and they have become part of our culture. And to the extent that um, the lawyers who are making these decisions for us now in cyberspace are inspired by those cases, Times v. Sullivan lives on. But final point, uh, it has its weaknesses, as Justices Black and Douglas um, pointed out in their concurrence. Uh, the actual malice test uh, invites, in, which is actually, as you know, it's sort of rec reckless disregard of the truth. It's not technically what we think of as malice. Um, have the editors and reporters been recklessly disregardful of the truth requires um, lengthy, expensive, and intrusive discovery into their state of mind and their editorial process. And experience with defamation law since Times v. Sullivan bears out that this uh, has a substantial chilling effect and is a problem. Uh, so I would suggest we can honor the spirit of Times v. Sullivan um, even while improving on it. Uh, state legislatures can go beyond the actual malice standard and simply eliminate liability for defamation of public officials. Uh, and our social media policy makers can make clear in their terms of service that they don't censor potentially defamatory content if it involves criticism of government. And they can even extend the policy to criticism of public figures as the Supreme Court later extended Times v. Sullivan. Today, of course, it's sometimes difficult to criticize government policy because we don't know what the policy is. Uh, disclosures by such whistleblowers as Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden have revealed secret drone strikes by our government, secret torture practices by our government, massive system of secret government surveillance. We have a secret FISA court that approves secret government search operations. And maybe social media sites can play a positive role. Um, um, not only by trimming their censorship policies to a minimum, but by fostering uh, robust and wide open access to the information that's necessary uh, for our democracy. Thank you. Hi there. So in addition to the reasons that uh, Marvin offers why 50 or 100 years from now uh, we might be remembering and venerating the names of the lawyers of Twitter and um, Google uh, is because probably we'll be getting our information from Twitter and Google and whatever they choose to venerate we will too. Um, if that weren't the case I would say that 50 or 100 years from now uh, certainly on the list should be Marvin and Marjorie as lawyers they have been working in so many different respects to secure freedom of speech in these technologically turbulent times so I think we owe them a debt and one that will be recognized uh, historically and I think it's a reason why we should try to look at where there does appear to be distance between the two of them in their understanding of what's going on. Now Marvin tried to cabin his excitement about Twitter and Google and their lawyers um, with oh yeah and they can censor too and I have some concerns about that and uh, that was a nice introduction to Marjorie who then had a bunch of concerns about that. So let me try to unpack that a little more thoroughly which is here are three models for mass communication. First is I think more apocryphal than real but here it is the 1789 model where you have a public that can communicate among itself in bulk mass communication in part because they've got the public squares, commonses, greenses, things like that, government spaces where we have through the years come to understand there are great restrictions on what the government should be able to do in those spaces in order to uh, regulate the speech. That This is the place, the Hyde Park corner, where uh, unfettered speech can go and government just can't shut down what it doesn't like. Fast forward to the time that we are celebrating today with a 50 year look back and we find that we have the New York Times perhaps as the speaker at that time. You get your news from the New York Times and it goes out to the public. So there's a directional arrow there and I think of it as a thicker uh, arrow because 
the New York Times reaches more people than somebody with a bullhorn on a common. So you can reach that many more people and you have the fourth estate then able to provide a counterbalance um, even as it's been described earlier it's not as if journalists are doing all the investigating in the world there uh, is. Sometimes governments investigate themselves and there are at least as many restaurant inspectors as there are critics and I don't know which we trust more to be straight about the quality of the food. Uh, I think we also might refine this model a little bit to say occasionally such as the instance that Marvin pointed out to us of the advertisement placed in the Times by third parties, not New York Times reporters, the public could use the New York Times as a megaphone if only it could convince the Times that what uh, the public had to say was either worthy of inclusion as a letter to the editor or an op-ed, good luck with that, or write them a check. <laughs> you write them a check, they do it, call it sponsored links of 1964. And I make that arrow a little bit narrower precisely because it's expensive to buy a full page ad in the Times or again expensive in effort and time to do it. But nobody doubted the kind of censorship, dare I call it censorship, the kind of editing that the New York Times would do in this instance, and in that sense, it's not really forming uh, the government space sort of thing. It's a very different mode of broadcast, and I think the differences between the two helps understand for us today's modes and the debate uh, over it, because you basically now have a mode that looks a little bit more like our conception of 1789. You have the public now talking to the public without a trusted intermediary providing that content, merely routing it. So you have Google and Facebook and Twitter and the like in the middle, and it's no longer just unidirectional again. And I think then, if you compare it to 1789, it looks structurally uh, quite similar, but there is a difference because, again, whereas in the middle on the left, the government is going to refrain from censorship, in the middle on the right, these companies are entitled to censor whatever they like, the First Amendment not applying to private parties. This is the danger that Marjorie's pointing out, and I think Marvin's answer to that is, that was 1789 and it wasn't real then anyway. Compared to 64, we still have that kind of intermediation going on. Your inability to be arrested for particularly outlandish speech is just sort of interesting and on the books, but in practical matter, your ability to be exposed to that outlandish speech is comparable more to 64 than to 1789. Now, uh, I think we do see also some mitigation in that while Google, Facebook, and Twitter retain the rights of the center column intermediary to choose to censor what they like, the volume is so great and they don't really view themselves as content providers that while they exercise or uh, retain the right to exercise control, they don't tend to do so as much as, say, a newspaper would, so it's a net bonus. You can also see, by the way, I've added the New York Times under the public. The New York Times can also try to get your attention through Google, Facebook, and Twitter along with everyone else. And that's the sort of thing that I took uh, Dave Anderson to be not so happy about, that the right model, whatever the thickness of the bands there, when you don't have good and trusted sources that answer to a muse other than mammon, uh, or, if it's the public, to whatever the like molar in their tooth, uh, the, the filling is vibrating, then you have a very poor quality of information. And when New York Times is the size that it is here, comparatively, that might be its own problem. So, uh, as we look a little more closely at these intermediaries, they do have some characteristics. Twitter may be kind of the one that's hardest to find trouble with because it pretty much lets everything true. I choose whom to follow and the tweets flow in here in a very algorithmic, predictable order. The tweets are pretty much uh, what the people I'm following are doing. The only kind of editorial impact Twitter has is along the left here where it makes suggestions on, I believe it should be whom to follow. I, maybe I'm being pedantic here. Where's William Sapphire when you need him? Um, and I. I don't know what it says that it's been suggested that I should follow God <laughs> and Scott Monty, whoever he is. You know, God, Scott Monty, one or the other you might enjoy. Probably God is quality and Scott Monty wrote a check because that's the kind of thing, again, that Twitter gets to decide 
um, how you decide what to follow. And there's also then a way to search, of course. So I searched for Harvard Law Review this morning, and um, it looks like a Sacramento native, congratulations, Rachel, was elected president of the Harvard Law Review. This just in. Um, so that's the uh, hard-hitting journalism of the Sacramento Bee at work. And uh, then Axel is here uh, 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 saying that Susan did a great job. Hashtag brilliant, Susan. Good for you on your presentation this morning. And then Mocha Dahl is tweeting something about Barack Obama. So um, this is very interesting because as yet we're still in this sort of um, antediluvian phase where uh, there isn't even as much SEO or Twitter bombing as you would think. Why shouldn't there be a ton of Harvard Law Review hashtag Rolex for sale with a link going on? And in part it's because Twitter has some algorithms of time, place, and manner uh, uh, sorts that try to get rid of that sort of stuff. Now, um, uh, Marvin uh, made reference to the kind of geographical zoning that takes place with all of these intermediaries in interestingly different ways. Here's the tweet withheld thing. I love how it hasn't been deleted. It's merely been withheld from you. It's in gray. You want to see the tweet, but sorry, it's withheld in your country. And uh, this is seen as better than having to delete it for all or for none. You don't have the problem of the sh convoy moving as slow as the slowest ship. And I think this is largely good. The only problem with it is it makes it so easy on countries to decide they just want to uh, censor for themselves. It basically does replicate the censorious structures around the world that maybe if you were a First Amendment absolutist, not wanting it to be a local ordinance, um, you might find uh, that you don't like this so much because it almost makes it too easy. I should add, by the way, if you find yourself in a country for which the tweet is withheld, what do you do next? Why, Twitter can let you change your country settings. You can just tell Twitter, you've misidentified my country. I'm not in Russia. I'm in the United States. And then you'll get to see all the withheld tweets. So this is a great example of a total fig leaf. This is really the only way in which it is functional is either as symbolism, which may be sufficient to the countries involved. I think for the hate speech purposes in Europe, all they want is the uh, symbolism. They don't really care so much if it goes around. Um, the other thing just might be Larry Lessig's observation that small fences can keep in large mammals. So uh, how much do you really want to see that great out tweet? Are you really going to figure out and then uh, go to change your country settings. But now, is this really the future? I think the more this gets to be uh, sort of abused by those wanting to fill up your feeds, you're going to be calling upon AI to help you know what your feed should say. And that's kind of the Facebook model, although Facebook decides every other week that it's going to change its model. But for the moment, Facebook fills my feed with stuff on some secret sauce that tells me among the friends I have uh, who I want. So here's something uh, about Stephen Hawking talking about the Syrian war. And then immediately after that, why, it's Marvin Amori tweeting about this very thing. And there I am working on this presentation uh, earlier today with a nice comment from a man named Eric who says, it's the Justice League of Intelligentsia. Um, it's, Always worrisome to be called intelligentsia, especially when we look like we're against the wall. But um, uh, in any case, how we uh, see what we see here is what Marjorie was pointing out is completely opaque. And that is very different from just, is it censored or is it not? But it's just as powerful to say, I am not seeing in between Marvin and the first tweet about Stephen Hawking, three tweets I might have wanted. Are we simply going to depend on Facebook saying, we just want to give you the most relevant stuff, and that makes you like Facebook even more. And that's why after this thing from Marvin, there are four things from Upworthy, once again, not telling you what they're going to say until you click on them. And that's what the market says you want to see. Modulo, of course, that people can pay money to inject uh, sponsored uh, Facebook links uh, into that flow. Um, I can't even control very easily the sources of people. I have a lot of friends on Facebook and I can't get rid of them. There is in fact no way to unfriend multiple people at once because apparently the market doesn't want that. You just, it'd be too hard, uh, uh, the rocket scientry involved in making that feature happen is beyond Facebook. So sadly I'm stuck with the friends I have. Um, no offense to any of my friends. Um, but we also see that 
these become platforms themselves, not just for content exchange through news feeds or through Twitter feeds, but through applications that use them for identity management purposes, for getting your social graph and helping you uh, uh, enlist your friends to a particular application, which may or may not be content-based. And more and more, actually, we see reason why Facebook and others in the middle are going to want to exercise a form of control for your own good. So this is some research that was done showing that Facebook apps actually end up asking for way more private data than they would nominally need to deliver to you an angry bird. Like they don't need to know your birthday so you can use a catapult. But uh, what we can see is Facebook and other app platforms in the middle being able then to say what will run and won't and to then drive content decisions through that. And I think that is kind of a problem because I don't want 1789 or even 1964 to be my baseline. I want the baseline that I can have now that we can wire people together so readily and the fact that these common platforms that my friends are on and so I can't just make a decision alone to leave uh, are ones that exercise this sort of subtle power um, worries me and I'm going to try a little later to worry you even more than you probably already are. But in the meantime, uh, it's also worth noting how ephemeral this kind of speech is. If you want to see what the New York Times of 1964 said, thanks to our trusty libraries or the Times' own archives, we can find that out. It's getting a lot harder, for instance, tw Twitter keeps tweets for how long? Seven days. Now you may be relieved if on day eight you regret what you wrote seven days ago, but for the purpose of the public sphere and being able to hold people accountable for what they say, to keep track of what was said, to source stuff, that's pretty bad. Now there are other sites that can help you search old tweets, all of which depend on the Twitter API and are completely contingent to Twitter indulging them and continuing to offer exactly that service. So because of this worry, both through social media uh, sites like Twitter and Facebook, and also just because the web at large depends on servers that decide to stay up and keep material where it is, we were actually interested to find out in uh, how often links, URLs, remain where they are. So we ran a study that found that 50% of the URLs within all Supreme Court opinions from 1789 to the present, um, I know that's a rather dramatic way to put it, from 1995 to the present, um, half of those links don't work anymore. And 72% of the links in the venerable Harvard Law Review do not work anymore. And uh, dead links are unlikely to zombieify, and live links may still be dying. So that is kind of a worry. So we cooked up something called PERMA. Uh, PERMA idea is that you can take a link that you're about to include in something that you want to preserve forever, like, of course, legal scholarship, and take it to a PERMA library, have it archived by that library, independent of wherever it is, Twitter, Facebook, or a website, and then get back a link that's meant to go to the library or any one of the 41 peer libraries maintaining this thing forever. Now, that seems to me a good example of an institution that isn't driven by money and yet also isn't the government, not to say that the government isn't driven by money, uh, that has values unto itself that it would be nice to wake up the lawyers here to figure out how to defend the stuff that gets archived against the various attacks that might come and the technological rot that can set in. Now, when I described this to Marvin this morning, here was his reaction. He said, you know what? We should just get rid of the links to begin with. Forget about archiving them. Why do we even have them? We have Google. You should just be able to Google any source you want. And that was striking to me. And I'm, I'm sorry, Marvin, for preserving forever. I will be making a <laughs> permalink of this quote for you. But it was surprising to me, the idea, this, this level of trust that that intermediary could be trusted to keep that thing, whichever it is, not only forever, but searchable as an early or first hit forever. And I, I especially am amazed at that against the backdrop of what Marvin was talking about, this whole report tweet, which means we are putting out to the public decisions about what to censor. It's one thing just to have somebody following a standard set by a lawyer who was one of Larry Lessig's students, so we know it's a good lawyer kind of thing. But when you can just have enough people downvote to report a tweet, and like after that, that, repeat, that tweet is out of there, I don't know about these 
private sheriffs who aren't even sheriffs. It's like, why have sheriffs when you can have a mob? I worry about that. And we've already started to see examples of private repositories of content formerly held by libraries and other sources tweaking it. This is War and Peace available on the Nook. I had a very slow day, so I was reading War and Peace. And here's one thing I saw. As soon as she heard his voice, a vivid glow nooked in her face. What the hell is that about? Oop, the same with the self officers Nooked by the tinder, burnt up. What the? Wait a minute. Every single time the word Kindle appears in War and Peace, given the length of it, it's quite frequently, the word nook has been substituted instead. This is a real problem for the integrity of the stuff to which we cite. I would almost rather it be deleted and then I would know I have to go in search of War and Peace rather than I've been given the special updated edition where the market gets to determine what's in the middle of the subordinate clause of the fifth sentence of the second paragraph. Now, I promised to scare you. This was to entertain you. Let me scare you now. Um, some of you may have seen go by this study in 2011 um, uh, well, I, I, this is the, the, the preliminary scaring. Um, the study in 2011 where it turned out that Zappos had a lot of reviews on the site offered by um, their customers, and it turns out their customers are only partially literate. So the reviews were not persuasive even when they were effusive because they didn't add up grammatically. So Zappos just went through um, and fixed all the spelling and grammar errors using Mechanical Turk. Um, improving the quality of the reviews on the site. And in correspondingly, they improved the demand for their products. Another example of the market working very well, but not in the way we think of for quality on all definitions of quality for the information we see. Here, this improvement in quality actually makes the reviews less informative and less truthful. That's my claim, at least, to the extent that we have the medium and the message both be important in the reviews. Now, here's the actual experiment that really, I think, should scare you. And I'd be curious to know what my co-panelists think about this. This was uh, the wonderful experiment that Facebook did when during the last US presidential election, it randomly chose to insert in some people's feed the fact that their friends had voted. So you could click this thing when you saw it that said you voted, and whether or not that appeared in your friend's feed was randomly determined so that they could then check and see if disproportionately people on Facebook who had been given the notice that their friends had voted had voted more often than people who hadn't. And the answer was yes. To a statistical significance, this made more people vote. So here's the hypothetical I want to ask you. Do you see any problem with Mark Zuckerberg saying, despite my union busting tendencies, I am a Democrat. I support the next Democrat who's going to run for president, and as a result, I will see to it that the Facebook feed more frequently says that the Democrats, uh, friends of Democrats, get the fact that their friends voted rather than friends of Republicans. Great example not of censorship, but of control over the conduit of user-generated speech made possible through the trade secret algorithm we're not allowed to know, and this sort of thing I don't know. There's not a First Amendment problem with that. In fact, he'd probably call it a First Amendment freedom of association plus. If you try to tell me I can't do it, you're stopping me from associating with all of my Democratic peeps. I don't know. I, I, the most I can think of is, well, at least be honest about it. Put in fine print somewhere that Ralph Nader can find that you're doing this, in which case he'll say, okay, I reserve the right to do this kind of thing. And I think that would be sufficient for notice. Uh, to do it. I, I kind of worry about this sort of stuff. I think de facto this is a very different speech environment than the one we had before. I should also point out one other issue which is we're not just talking about speakers and readers. We're talking about in Soviet Russia the book reads you. And since 1996 there has been fear expressed about what happens when you can actually watch the people who are watching the movie or reading the book. 
and uh, that data is being gathered every time you read a Kindle. As an author, I'd love to know that it's the second paragraph of the third chapter that turns everybody off, and that's when they put it down, because I'll not only change it in the next edition, maybe I can do an update and change it in the existing edition in people's hands. And uh, here's the patent that Microsoft applied to where your uh, 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 Xbox um, uh, Connect will watch how many people are in the living room so it can see whether it's become a public performance because you invited too many people over for the Super Bowl and you should be charged appropriately. I await the first couch designed for you to hide under so that you can watch it and the Connect will not know. But not only is that sort of creepy, but it means that there are opportunities to monitor the flow of speech, to draw from it in ways that could have chilling effects, even if it's for good purposes, and to translate those chilling effects into the real world. So as we see more and more places that might want to identify you on the way in, and it becomes technologically simple and cheap to do that, they can make decisions by tying together various identities, whether your rants on Facebook make you unworthy to sit in that particular Ruby Tuesdays. It doesn't happen now, and the question is, does it not happen now because Ruby Tuesdays doesn't want to do that, or does it not happen now because they had no way to do it before? We're about to find out. So I guess I want to conclude by saying my charge, if I had one, to uh, the lawyers working at Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and to us who could lobby and pressure those companies to be more speech friendly, should actually be, be looking for ways to change how those services operate. So for a while, Google News had a feature where if you were quoted in an article indexed by Google News, you would be especially privileged to write a comment about your quote to Google and have that featured next to uh, the article. So this guy, Bert at Loomis, was quoted in the Kansas City Star. He got to unpack his quote because the journalist had, as is traditional, totally butchered it. And now he got to say exactly what he meant. To me, that's a great example of an intermediary working in a great way. There was no business model for it. This doesn't exist anymore. That's too bad. I thought it was a good idea. The market appears to have proved it otherwise. Similarly on Twitter, it would be great to think about how might we implement retracting a tweet so that people of good faith who tweet something, this is an outrage, and then realize after being directed to Snopes that it is in fact not an outrage, it's merely clickbait, could say, I withdraw the previous outrage and have that cascade down all the paths that the outrage had run like the rivulets of a stream. There are ways to do this if you could persuade the intermediary that instead of honing things to get you to uh, uh, follow a sponsored link, that actually thinking about themselves as true custodians of the public sphere could really make a difference. So institutionally speaking, I think of somebody who just three years after New York Times v. Sullivan, Fred Friendly, president of CBS, who left CBS. He resigned after, uh, I believe it was Vietnam War protests or hearings of some kind uh, that he tried to get uh, I Love Lucy preempted and failed, so he quit. Um, he's known to have said, television uh, makes, sorry, so much at its worst that it can't afford to be its best. And it's a weird observation that sometimes something can be so successful and profitable that holding up the banner that Marvin celebrates among the lawyers and that we should absolutely encourage, sometimes we need institutions who exist solely or primarily for that banner rather than just having the GC's office um, doing that as well. And that's the kind of future I would love to see us build. Thank you. Marvin, do you have any comments you want to make? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to, to thank both of you for such thoughtful comments or, and for reading my piece and taking it uh, for, for, for really thoughtful comments. I'm going to begin with, uh, with agreeing with Jonathan that we do need more institutions. Uh, there are lots of institutions that we probably agree should be involved. Um, and we have, um, you know, we have a sort of world of imperfect institutional alternatives, right? Every institution is imperfect in their own way, uh, from judges and Congress and 
uh, corporations and nonprofits, right? So you, have, you, you sort of try to think through the best that you can do with the institutions you have uh, available. Uh, let me actually defend my argument that we should get rid of links in law reviews. Uh, they're long, they're ugly, they tell you when you last checked them, which was years ago. Uh, usually I can just use the author and the title to find whoever I'm, whatever article I'm looking for through Google or Bing or Yahoo. Uh, so I, I do stand by that. Aesthetically, I think it's hideous. Um, and so- You're talking about links to other scholarship. I'm thinking about links to everything because. Oh no no! I'm thinking I'm thinking of links to to uh, news articles or the ones that have like long links in uh, in in the footnotes of law reviews. I just I just find those hideous and I and I I don't usually even put them in myself. Um, and so my my excitement um, my excitement over these lawyers. Uh, it occurred to me that you know, having studied under Lessig is something that I would kind of use as a marker, as a shorthand, in the same way that when people say that all of the Fisk judges were appointed by Justice Roberts, that makes me think differently than had they all been appointed by Ron Wyden. Right? So it's just sort of a, something that, to me, seems persuasive. Um, and I'm easily excited because I think of the world as a long history of, uh, of genocide and slaughter. And, uh, and God, the Twitter account that you were encouraged to follow, I do follow. And it's very funny. And uh, yesterday he tweeted, I want nothing for Valentine's Day except for my usual 145,000 dead bodies. Uh, and so. Uh, his worldview and mine uh, tend to align. So, so when, when you I say funny, you mean strange rather than hot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean funny. So when I see glimmers of, of, of hope uh, in, in corporate America, I get maybe overly excited. So uh, responding to um, just sort of the notion that these companies will get it wrong quite a bit when it comes to what content to show you that's relevant and what content to to censor, right? The, uh, to the extent that Twitter gets a billion tweets every three days, I mean, their argument is just, we get a lot of tweets. Facebook gets lots of posts. It's hard to do, right? Their argument is, we're doing our best. And when it comes to the other institutional alternatives, you could try to implement uh, judicial, legislative, et cetera, to, uh, to improve the situation, right? We do, as you said, lobby these companies to improve their their, um, their procedures, but I can't think of governmental procedures that would be far better than, than the current procedures we have for them. Maybe there are, but the task at hand is very difficult to have a legal structure that allows YouTube to have 100 hours of video being uploaded every minute and to make as few errors as possible in terms of deleting them or highlighting them. So, so I guess the only argument is it's kind of hard. And I'm gonna ag agree completely with Marjorie on the loophole in 230. So as we mentioned, um, right now, if I defame or libel uh, Mark Tushnet on YouTube or Twitter or Tumblr, uh, I'm liable, not any of those companies. Right? They have an immunity. Um, the immunity for copyright is more complicated. And when you talk to the lawyers at these companies about it, they'll say it's an eight or a nine, not a 10. You know, we might think it's a five. Uh, they've done some litigation to try to improve the situation. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, they, they, uh, they recognize its deficiencies, including the fact that um, if, a, if a copyright holder sends in a notice saying that I violated copyright and it gets taken down, for me to get it put back up, I have to reveal who I am. And I might be an anonymous Twitter account, and I might be, um, to give one example that comes up pretty often uh, in these interviews, let's say that I attack um, Grendel's Den for having bad beer, right? It's a place down the street that has beer, I guess. Uh, Grendel's Den might send a takedown notice under the DMCA to WordPress saying that my blog post violates their copyright by having a picture of their logo and mentioning them, right? Um, and then I would have to reveal who I am, and I might be an employee at Grendel's Den. That, the, the idea of unmasking people through the DMCA comes up. The other loophole that I mentioned in the article uh, to 230 is trademark. There's no real procedure to make sure that if I, you know, criticize Grendel's Den by, tr you know, mentioning their trademark, that WordPress is guilty or not. There's no procedure there under the DMCA or, or 230. So that's a, another loophole. But I, I completely agree that there, there could be more done. And then, and then I guess my final biggest disagreement is 
I kind of like safe search on Google. Uh, I have a friend who showed me Tumblr without safe search and just put in a few terms that seemed innocuous like rough or daddy or daughter and it was horrifying what came up immediately of different GIFs and photos and so I, I tend to, 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 at least for Tumblr, I tend to prefer safe search but, but you can turn it off uh, if you want. Okay, um, I'm not sure I, I disagree with the second point at all that, that these companies would replicate the existing structure. Um, in terms of the, the tension between uh, international norms and congressional power, uh, I'm, I think you could have both of them have an influence on the way these companies uh, address freedom of expression, both uh, the fact that if you're WordPress or Tumblr, you rely heavily on American law to point to 230. And then if you expand into new, company, into new countries and you have to have people on the ground who could be arrested, that's where international uh, norms actually take on a greater role than they would otherwise take on. So I think you, you could have both. And it, it might be that the companies are trying to have it both ways, but I still think both are influential. And, and I've been subject to hate speech mainly on radio and TV, so, so I, I, my, my experience is very different, right? It's sort of the, the Glenn, Glenn Becks of the world, so. I have just one question for Jonathan. Is that story about war and peace really true? <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, so yes, that story is really true, and my hypothesis is um, it was a third-party seller putting a book through the nook that had previously been a Kindle book and they had wrapped it in some dross advertising and so some editor trying to prepare it for nook just did a global search and replace to make it more nook worthy not realizing it would be affecting the substance of the book. So a fairly innocuous, that's just my inference, fairly innocuous explanation and while I'm holding the mic I'm just going to say um, on the Facebook feeds what I would love would be some form of practice or rule whereby it would be my right as a Facebook user to have API access to my feeds and then others could write software that I could run that could slice and dice the feeds from my friends all sorts of ways rather than vertically integrating Facebook as the uh, accumulator and Facebook as the searcher or feed producer. So uh, I, I'm not in disagreement with that. And if you lobbied to get a law passed to do that or lobbied Facebook directly, I think there might be an interesting Potentially, you know, there'd be the usual First Amendment argument that yeah. would be made by Facebook, right? Which I probably wouldn't agree with them, them on. Compelled speech. Yep. Which I, I would be on your side of that one. I mean, so when it comes to Facebook versus Twitter, right? Facebook allows you to, forces you to use your real name. You can only have one account, right? They're, in their world, you're your real person dealing with your family and everyone who's on your feed. It's, sort of, it's generally bilateral, not, not so much anymore, but usually you can post and I can see what you're posting and we're friends. Uh, they're very curated. They're, they're, you know, they, they don't allow anonymous speech. They get lots of criticism for what they do and they think of themselves as a sort of space where you are yourself online with your family. Right? Twitter, 
which is probably why, why, why a lot of free speech folks are more enthusiastic about Twitter, they're you know, a fire hose, they're like the public square, you can tweet whatever, you can follow whoever you want is the idea, they don't follow you back. And even though they have a line in their terms of service, which is essentially, you know, it's legalese, we can block whatever we want, whenever we want to, period. Right? Just, it's like complete discretion. Uh, when they actually specify things, it tends to only exclude direct threats to individuals. And that's partly because of the product, right? They're, they think of their product very differently from the way Facebook thinks of their product. And they celebrate multiple um, usernames, anonymous usernames, et cetera. So, if you are uh, angry with Facebook's policies, you know, kind of join the club. Um, but but they, they think of what they do. They think, they think that they're actually, they will defend their policies to you by saying, people use Facebook for activism because they know real people are there and they know who these real people are. Whereas if you're on Twitter and some person starts following you and they're God, you have no idea who God is. And so, that, so that's Facebook's counter argument. And I'm, and I'm not, and I don't know enough to evaluate that take, really. I, I, I just, if God is following you on yeah. Facebook, <laughs> it's you probably not no God. Idea who God is either. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good idea before, and now I'm just confused. <laughs> well, who knows? This is an angry God, that's for okay, sure. Okay, so uh, I think we'll uh, take a break now till uh, 10 of and uh, reconvene for the uh, fourth panel. So that's now a little inaccurate. I'll update this. Uh, so. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. That was awesome. Thank you.